Well, good morning. How are we doing? It is good to see you. I want to welcome everybody joining us online as well as Lake County. Good to have you as well. And uh, we are starting, as you can see, a brand new series. And I have a little bit of awkward slash bad news. I've been gone for uh, the month of June. And right before I got up, I turned to my wife and I said, I'm a little emotional, which is not good for a sermon. So you're going to have to bear with me. I'm emotional because I missed you. And being back... Um, <laughs> You're not, you're not helping with this process. <laughs> if you're in Lake County, they all stood and just cheered. And um, <laughs> likewise, what you're probably doing now. I, I am. Uh, I, I'm emotional for those that are new here. My name is Dustin Agard, one of the pastors. Honored to be here. Welcome to Journey. Um, in the month of June, I had two weeks of vacation and then had a two week study break where. Just got away to study, to pray, to dream, to plan, and prepare for the next season. And uh, I felt your prayers and more than, than ever. And so just thank you for praying. Thank you for the encouragement, the notes, and excited to see what God does in the, in the next couple seasons. But it's good to be back. As our family was gone in the month of June, we went to four different churches, and they were all incredible churches. And God spoke to us, and we went there, and we were encouraged. And it's just the beauty of the church. But my wife and I left with the same feeling. We said that was good, but it wasn't journey. And we miss you. And we miss your grace. We miss your love. We miss the, the multicultural, multi generational church that you are and the beauty that you are. And so it's good, good to be back. As you can see, we're starting this series called The Goat, the greatest of all time. And if you are a sports fan, you've seen that there have been uh, entire shows dedicated to people just debating and debating and ba debating who is the greatest of all time. And we're just going to put that to rest. I think anytime there's a good debate, we could always handle it with a good church vote. So what we're going to do is we're just going to have a vote, figure out who is the greatest of all time. So if you're online in Lake County, Apopka, I want everybody to vote. We're going to put up two athletes, and you're going to say which you think is the greater one over the other one. And so you could uh, make some noise. You could raise your hand. You may not know who the athletes are. Just vote on which photo is your favorite photo, okay? <laughs> so here we go. First one is this. Tom Brady yeah. or Joe Montana? Actually, Joe got more than I thought here in Apopka. Uh, Tom Brady, Tom Brady wins. Okay. Some of you may not know this one, some of you may. Uh, Messi, Ronaldo. Third vote. Who are they? It's only the largest sport in the world, okay? It was kind of a tie between, we don't know who they are, okay. How about this one? Phelps. Mark Spitz. <laughs> Who are they? It's, a, it's okay. They're swimmers. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so it's, all right, how about this one? Babe Ruth. <laughs> Hank Aaron. I think Hank Aaron uh, got that one. Hank Aaron gets my vote. Uh, it's good. How about this one? Tiger Woods. Jack Nicholas. Whoa, Jack completely won in Apopka. And the last one, I don't even think it's a debate, Michael Jordan, yeah. LeBron James. <laughs> but the record state, we had two people in Apopka <laughs> for LeBron James. Horace Grant. Horace Grant, what? what is going on? I'm going to vote Michael Jordan. So yeah, so you can see there's all these debates, but there's one debate that's not being had, and that's if Jesus is the goat. Jesus is the goat of goats, and nobody's debating that. And we have this idea in us that God put in us, this desire to be great. Some of you have this desire to be great, and you're wondering if that's okay, and the answer is yes, because God put that there. God put in you the desire to be great. It's just he redefines what great looks like. And that's what this series is going to talk about is how did Jesus redefine greatness? But it's okay to be great. It's okay to aspire to be great. You should aspire to be a great parent, to be a great teacher, a great barista, a great neighbor, a great friend, a great student, a great athlete. You should aspire to those things. As a matter of fact, this is what Ecclesiastes 9.10 says. Whatever your hand finds to do, 
do it with all your might, saying, go, be great, the best that you can possibly be. Jesus is the one and only goat. He, he changed how our world looks at, at kids, at women, at leadership, at the government. Uh, he changed the arts. He changed every spectrum that we can imagine. Jesus single-handedly changed that for the history of the world. He put servant leadership on the map. I don't know if you know this, but every major religion looks up to Jesus and honors him in some way. Not only do they believe in him, they honor him in some way, shape, or form. Every major religion. This is what Colossians 1 says. It says this, the Son, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. Philippians 2 says this, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Translation, Jesus is the goat. And you might be thinking, well, of course the Bible is going to say that. Do you have any sources outside the Bible? How about Time Magazine? In 2013, Time Magazine wanted to do a survey, do a study to figure out who's the most significant person in the history of the world. The editors came together. They had all these analytics, all these questions, all these ways of figuring out and tracking. They made a top 100 list of the most significant influential people in the history of the world. And what they came to find out in 2013 study, it was not a theological study. It was a study on greatness. What they came to find out is that the number one by far was this guy named Jesus of Nazareth. The most significant person cannot be debated. Whenever we look at goats, one of the things that people love to do is, is get behind, whether it's, it's goat leadership, uh, goat actors, actresses, or goat athletes, want to figure out, okay, what is it behind the, the scenes that makes them the goat? What's their secret sauce? And almost all of them have some type of secret sauce. For Tom Brady, his secret sauce is his radical diet. He has this incredibly crazy diet, which is, I think, one of the reasons why he could play in his mid-60s or however old he is. <laughs> he's 40. He's not 40. I think he's, how old is he? 44, 43. So I don't know. You're all looking it up. Okay. For Michael Phelps, he had these intense workouts, but his secret sauce wasn't his workouts. He had a really, really regimented sleeping pattern for his body to recover that, that nobody messed with. He would never change him recovering and sleeping was his secret sauce. Michael Jordan's uh, secret sauce was this. He, he had a drive to embrace failure, and he took it as a challenge to succeed. This is what Michael Jordan said. He said, I missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. I failed over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. So those are their secret sauce. What, what's Jesus' secret sauce? I, I, think, I think I have a guess at what his secret sauce is. I think we find it in John 5, 19. It says this, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He, he can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. I think Jesus' secret sauce was his extreme followership of the father. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Jesus' secret sauce was his extreme followership of the father. I believe Jesus got his leadership from his followership. There, there's no debate that Jesus is the greatest leader to ever live. That's, that's why he is significant, but we don't hear a lot about his followership. And that's what we wanna lean in today and kind of look at what does this mean that he had extreme followership. Earlier this year, I read something that I think might be one of the greatest lines that Jesus had that I've never heard anybody talk about, and it kind of goes in this idea of followership. But before I give you that great line, I wanna unpack where it's coming from, the story behind it. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew 26. If you don't have your Bible, we're gonna have it on the screen, or you can uh, uh, open up your Bible app on your phone or your device, follow along with us in Matthew 26. So, Matthew 26 comes and Jesus gathers his buddies that he calls the disciples. There's 12 of them. He calls together disciples and he tells them something significant. 
something that we, we remember every week. It's the Lord's Supper, it's communion. He says, hey, listen, I'm about to be led away to be tortured and killed and crucified. And he tells them this. And it's just this, this just devastating news. And then he goes from that, and then he goes into a garden, and that's where the next scene sets up. And I want us to pick up in Matthew 26, verse 36, and we'll go from there. It says this, then Jesus went, with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as as I will, but as you will. So Jesus prays so much that he's overwhelmed with sorrow, as it says, to the point of death. And he goes away and prays, and then he comes back, and the disciples are sleeping. And then he goes away and prays the second time, comes back, the disciples are sleeping again, goes away, third time, comes back, and, and apparently the disciples were on the Michael Phelps plan because they are sleeping yet again. And that's where we pick up in verse 45. It says this, then he, Jesus, returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. And this is the line that messed with me. So Jesus prays for something just like many of us prayed. Prayed and prayed and prayed. And God answered him, but not with a yes. God answered him with a no. And I want you to look at how Jesus responded. This is how he responds when he hears God's answer. He says, rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus prays over and over and over again. God, would you take this cup? Would you take this cup? God, would you do this? God, would you give me that job? God, would you restore this? God, would you heal this? Whatever it is, over and over and over again, he gets the answer and his response is, rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayal. He's not saying, rise, let's run away. Here comes the bad guys. He's saying, no, rise, I have an appointment. Here comes my betrayer. Extreme followership. Extreme followership. Rise, Let's go, here comes my betrayer. So today what I want us to do is I wanna look at three things that we can learn from the story of Jesus in Matthew 26. First one is this, number one, Jesus exemplified radical obedience to the Father. It's radical obedience. And we're learning about Jesus because the Bible says that we are Many Jesus, that's what it means. We are followers of Christ. So whatever he did, if he's a radical follower of the Father, then that means we're to be radical followers of the Father as well. Many of us have met really, really great leaders. Some of us have met great followers. I think Jesus did both extremely well. I think he was both a great leader and a great follower. And I think that's what we as Christians are called to be, both great followers and great leaders, not necessarily one or the other. And I think Jesus, I think that's what made Jesus the goat. The problem is this. I mean, we're celebrating the 4th of July and happy 4th to everybody. And uh, I love, I love everybody wearing their festive gear, by the way. And we're celebrating the 4th and it's the independence. Like this is what we as Americans, like we want to be independent. Don't tell me what to do. Like, I don't want to have this radical obedience. I want to be me. I want to be myself. I want to be an individual. But the problem is when you give your life to Jesus, you're no longer independent. You're dependent on the father. It's his way, it's his will, it's what he wants. But we struggle with that. There's this, this four-year-old girl that struggled with that, much like you and I. She loved riding her tricycle. And the mom said, hey, I gotta go inside the house for just a minute or two. You could drive on the driveway or you could drive in the front sidewalk between this tree and this tree. That's it, you can't go on the road, you can't go to the neighbors, nothing. If you go outside those boundaries, you're gonna get a spanking. She said, do you understand? The four-year-old looked, looked uh, at mom and said this, well, you might as well spank me now. I got places to go. <laughs> that sounds familiar, right? Like, like God's like, hey, listen, you got this, this, and we're like, hey, may as well spank me now, God. I got places to go. And this idea of followership, this idea of obedience doesn't come natural. 
That's why we need the Holy Spirit. It comes supernatural. That's why in him we're a new creation. The old creation's gone. We are a new creation in him. Jesus said this in Matthew 16. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I have three teenagers right now, which means I pay more in auto insurance than any of you combined. <laughs> so, when we drive, we're in the driver's seat. And that's what all of us have been. All of us have been in the driver's seat at some point in our life. And the moment we gave our lives to Jesus, we got out of the driver's seat and we said, no, 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 you drive now. I'm gonna be a passenger. You see, when before Christ, our BC days, we went wherever we went, we did whatever we wanted to do, we thought whatever, whatever it is, we drove, we did that because we were in charge. We were the idol that we worship. But when we became Christ followers, the idea of making Jesus Lord is saying, no, 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 you are now in control. Wherever you wanna go, whatever you wanna do, it's you. I'm a passenger, I'm not a driver. You drive. Every day I wake up, say, God, you are the one steering the wheel, not me. I do what you want, I say what you want. If you want me to bless a neighbor, if you want me to forgive, whatever it is, you steer the car, not me. It's yours. That's what it means to follow Christ. It's to let him take the wheel. And so many of us had said, hey, Jesus, it's kind of like me with my kids teaching them how to drive. Hey, listen, I don't mind you driving, but I'm gonna have one hand on the wheel because you are freaking me out. And we're like, hey, Jesus, take me wherever you wanna go. And you're like steering it to the right. Wherever you wanna go, Lord, I'll go. And you're, you're trying to still control. That's not making him Lord of your life. That's you still in control. And so I don't know where it is that you need to relinquish control, but there's an unexplainable sense of freedom where the only person you're trying to please is the Father. And that's what Jesus did. And I think that's one of the reasons he had so much peace. He wasn't trying to please everybody in the world, just the Father. Second thing we learn from this story is this. Who you follow tells me where you're going. Who you follow tells me where you're going. The word disciple occurs 269 times in the New Testament. The word Christian is three times in the New Testament. The New Testament is a book about disciples, by disciples, and for disciples of Jesus. If you're not familiar with the idea of disciples, it's really laid out in this verse, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. It's discipleship. And so I'd ask you this question. Who have you aligned with? Who have you said, hey, they're further along in their faith than me. I want to align myself with them. I want to follow them as they follow Christ. I need to give myself permission to somebody that says, hey, you look more like Jesus than I, and I want to look more like you. I want to be a godly parent like you, a godly businessman or woman like you, a godly neighbor like you. Will you pour into me how you follow Jesus? Will you teach me? That's discipleship. Who you follow tells me where you're going. When I was in middle school, I was in an acting class. I have no idea why I was in acting class. I've never pursued acting. It was probably because it was an easy A. I was in this acting class and we had this project, this exercise that we had to do. We had to make a paper mache mask. And we spent a couple weeks making this mask uh, fitted to each person's head. So I made it, put it on, and, and there were no eye holes. You can only have uh, uh, breathing holes like through your nose and mouth, and that was it. So you couldn't see. We made them. We had no idea why we were making them. Then after we made them, they all dried a couple weeks later. The teacher says, all right, we got a project. Everybody pair up. I said, all right, that, that's music to a middle school years when you don't do work and you pair up with your buddy. So I pair up with my best friend. So he and I are together, and she says, this is what you're going to do. One of you are going to put on a mask at a time. You're going to walk around the entire school campus, and, and the person without the mask has to lead the person with the mask. You cannot touch them. You can only listen to their voice. Listen, I happen to go first. When you are a middle school boy, I don't care how godly another middle school boy is, you're not trusting any middle school boy. <laughs> Ever. Ever. So I go and I am so nervous because I know what my buddy's gonna do. So I have a mask on, I can't see anything, and he's guiding me. If he says left one, I gotta go left one, he says right one. But I know it's rigged, I know he's gonna lead me to destruction. I just hope I survive. So I'm going, I'm going, and, and long story short, after 20 minutes, I don't have a clue where I'm at. He tried spinning, took me to where I wouldn't know. All of a sudden he goes, okay, take your mask off. 
And if this is the roof of the, the first floor, I was about this far from the edge of the roof. I was on the roof of the building. He said, take your mask off. You see, there's some stairs that go up to the second floor and on the stairs was the roof, the kind of the picture of the roof where I had to climb over and get on the roof. And so now I'm here and I take my mask off and I begin to freak out. And when I allow a middle school buddy of mine to lead me, of course I'm gonna have anxiety. You know what doesn't make sense is when God leads me and I have the same anxiety. Why do I treat God like he's a middle school buddy instead of the Lord of the universe that has only my best interest in mind? You see, I follow God just as hesitant sometimes as my middle school buddy's directions. And so when he says go left, I'm not just going left. I'm kind of like a little bit like, I don't know, God. I don't know if I should do this. And when he says forgive, I'm like, I don't know if I should forgive. And when he says be generous, I'm like, I don't know if I can be generous. And all these things, it's like I'm treating him like my middle school best friend. And the God of the universe has never broken a promise. He's never done anything to, to ruin his character that he only has my best interest in mind. So why do we treat him like he can't be trusted? Why do we treat him with hesitancy when he says, go forward or go backwards, turn left, turn right. That's what I love about Jesus' radical followership of the Father. This is what Andy Stanley says. He says this, following Jesus will make your life better and will make you better at life. Following Jesus will make your life better and make you better at life. You cannot go wrong with following Jesus. And my prayer is that we would strip off the hesitancy and be a church of faith that just runs after the Father without anything holding us back. Not like we're following the orders from a middle school buddy, but like we're following the orders from the God of the universe. And so let me ask you, who in your life looks like Jesus and who have you invited to pour into you? Now here's the thing, I don't ask people are you hanging around Christians? Because so many people say they're a Christian, but they don't follow Jesus. I'm not asking you that. Who is following Jesus that you have given permission to be in your life and you've asked them, can you follow them? And if you've not done that, that is called discipleship. The entire New Testament is about discipleship. I want this week, I wanna encourage you, have coffee with somebody and say, hey, listen, you seem like a godly uh, a neighbor or godly this or that. Can we just hang out from time to time? I just wanna learn from you. I want you to speak into my life. I want to give you a green light to tell me how to be a godly husband, a godly father. You have permission to call me out when you see I step out of line. Somebody should have permission to do that. Nobody wants to speak up this day and age unless you give them permission. And that's part of the discipleship process. Who you follow tells me where you're going. Third thing is this that I learned. The Father's will is greater than my wants. The Father's will is greater than my desires, my will, whatever you want to say. I was in a quiet time, and maybe in February, March, somewhere in there, just in my, my study, and I began to get on a rabbit trail, just this random rabbit trail in Scripture. And I kind of want to walk you through, if I can, I want to walk you through my rabbit trail. Because these, these are three things that I kind of processed, four, maybe four things that I processed in my quiet time. First one says, Galatians 1.10 says this, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I'd not be a servant of Christ. So under that, I put God is greater than people. You see, a lot of our anxiety can sometimes come when we're trying to please people more than God. And there's a peace that we get when we're only having an audience of one. So this verse talks about in Galatians 1.10 that God is greater than people. Then I went to Philippians 2. It says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking out to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. So now here I read this, and it's like, okay, now people are greater than me. So now people are greater than me. According to this verse, they're supposed to be greater than me. The first one's God's greater than people. Now people are greater than me. Then I read John 3.30. He must be, become greater. I must become less. What that verse teaches me is God's greater than me. So now I got these three things. I got God is greater than people. People are greater than me and God is greater than me. I'm thinking I'm literally overwhelmed in my own quiet time. I'm like, God, how can I live this out? 
I mean, if God is greater than people, people are greater than me and God's greater than me, how am I constantly gonna live this out? And then he took me to Galatians 2.20 and says this, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's how we live it out. You see, we live out that process by no longer driving because I can't drive, that's, a, that's too hard for me to handle. I can't keep driving that. We do it by realizing we've been crucified, that it's no longer I that live, no, no longer that I that drives, but it's, it's Christ. And when I let Christ drive, he walks me through those three things almost easily every day. The days that I struggle are the days that I wanna drive. Those are the days that I struggle the most. When I wanna spend the time that I wanna spend, when I wanna do what I wanna do, when I wanna talk and say or visit, whatever it is, those are the days that I struggle the most. Last weekend, actor Ben Affleck went car shopping with his boo, J-Lo. I don't know if you heard this story. Of course, they don't go and buy normal cars. He wanted to go look at a yellow Lamborghini. So last week, him and J-Lo went shopping and they see this yellow Lamborghini. They're at a luxury car dealership. And I want you to pay attention because I want this to help you the next time you go shopping for a Lamborghini. So I want everybody to lean in. Listen, this is not just inspirational. We want to be practical here at Journey, okay? So they're shopping. He sees this yellow Lamborghini and he says, hey, I want to, I want to, I want to test drive this. So he gets in. J-Lo is in the back seat. He gets in the front, he starts the engine. The engine is running. And I don't know why, I don't know how this happened, but he thought it would be a good idea to let his 10-year-old son sit behind the wheel of the car. And so his 10-year-old son gets in the wheel of the car, and I don't know if this is on accident, on purpose, I don't understand what the 10-year-old was doing, but all of a sudden, the car is now in reverse. And a luxury car dealership and the car backs up and hits another luxury car. Here's the moral of the story. Next time you go Lambo shopping, <laughs> leave your kids at home, okay? Every time I go Lambo shopping, I leave my kids at home. I'm telling you guys, it doesn't work. Listen, it's easy for you and I to read a headline like that and go, of course, a 10-year-old boy should not be behind the wheel of a Lambo especially if it's not even his. Why was he behind? Why was he in the driver's seat of a Lamborghini? It makes no sense. I would say the same thing is true. Why do you think you and I should be behind the wheel of our lives? It's not ours. If you're a Christian, your life is no longer yours. It's Christ. And your life is way more valuable than a luxury car. Your life is way more valuable than a Lamborghini. And you have no business driving it because it's not yours. It's the Father's. And just like it was irresponsible and reckless for that 10-year-old boy to be behind the wheel, I think it's irresponsible and reckless for us that call ourselves Christians to try to still drive when Christ is already in the seat. And I don't know where you need to give up the steering wheel of your life some of you, you're trying to drive everything in your life and you need to give your life to Jesus and say, listen, once and for all, I'm gonna give him the wheel. Some of you, you've already given your life to Jesus and you're like, listen, God, you could have everything but not my romantic relationships because I'm still gonna sleep with who I want, live with who I want, do what I, I'm gonna have one hand on the wheel but everything else you could do and you need to let go. Some of you, it's like, God, you can do whatever you want, but I'm gonna control my finances. I'll do everything else, but the finances are mine. Or God, you can do whatever you want, but the family is mine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold the family. They're my idol. Or God, the future is mine, or the work is mine. And we have one hand on the wheel, and we're still trying to let God drive, and it just doesn't work like that. You know what the universal sign of surrender is? It's hands up. Go anywhere around the world. What do we do when we worship? It's hands up. I don't know why everybody else raises their hands. I raise my hands as an as a admission to God that I need to surrender today once again to him, that my hands are off the wheel and I surrender fully. And I don't know what it is you need to surrender today, but we're all a work in progress. There's something all of us can say, God, would you forgive me? I'm letting go and I'm trusting you. I wanna share a story about my son. My son just graduated 
from high school, my son Riley. Son, uh, this is my, my only son, my firstborn. So we have all the feels and just graduated. And I don't know if you can remember, some of you are in this age, but that 17 year old to 20 year old window is one of the most anxiety filled seasons of your life at up to that point because you have no idea of the future. You're tired of being asked, what are you doing after you graduate? Because you don't know. You don't know what school you're gonna get into. You don't know what program. You don't even know if you're gonna graduate, if you can handle God. There's so much anxiety about the next. Riley started off his high school career wanting to be a big engineer. And he was great at studying for that. In the middle of studying for that, he felt like God called him into full-time vocational ministry and he wants to be a pastor. And now in that, he started the past couple summers going to a camp in Northeast Georgia called Woodlands. And I think Woodlands is one of the best camps in the nation. They teach uh, leadership development, ministry. They do so much. In the past couple summers, he's been able to go there through this program called SALT. And this is him, beast in it. And they have a program for 18 to 25 year olds. It's a very, very popular camp. It's huge, it's incredible. They have a program for 18 to 25 year olds that it's a, a one year long program. And so he would potentially go and, and study and, and be under this program and serve the camp for a year, but it's very, very hard to get into. And so he applied and, and they said, hey, we'll let you know in the middle of the summer. Now, the middle of the summer is hard for somebody his age because the next starts in August. And so he's in this anxiety-filled waiting period. And, and not too long ago, several months ago, Riley and I are talking and he's like, listen, I, I don't know what my next is. I don't know if I'm gonna get into this program. I don't know if, it, if it's college. I don't know. He said, but this is what God told me. He said, dad, God didn't tell me if I'm gonna get into the Woodlands program. He said, he didn't give me that that insight. He said, what he did tell me is that I'm supposed to trust him 100% no matter what through this process. And if he says no, I'm supposed to trust him. If he says yes, I'm supposed to trust him. And as a dad, so proud because what he was doing is he was saying, my hands are off the wheel. And as a dad, there's no greater feeling than when your son or daughter walks fully in compliance with the Lord. And I watched those weeks and months. He didn't stress. He didn't have anxiety. And then last week, they called up and said, you've been accepted into the program. <laughs> Riley, my son is, is in this service. He's right there. Riley, I want you to know I love you. So incredibly proud of you. And listen, I'm not, I mean, yeah, I'm proud that he got in the program, but I'm, I'm more proud, and I told him this, of how you walk through the process. Because you can get all the trophies, all the jobs in the world, but if you don't do it the right way, it's not gonna make you closer to Jesus. It's not just about where you land, but how do you get there? And I don't know what you're going through but my prayer today is that you would let go of the steering wheel, not even a pinky on it. Just two hands right there. You just buckle. Maybe you even need to get in the back seat. Maybe you got too much control. You just need to get in the back seat. Maybe you need to get in the trunk. <laughs> hey, listen, if you get in the trunk, you're gonna be right next to me. That's where I need to be. <laughs> Say, Jesus, I'm not in control. I can't control my kids can't control what he's going to do, she's going to do. I can't control my boss. Not only can I not control it, I'm not going to try to control it. Would you help me to have extreme followership like Jesus? That was his secret sauce to being the goat. When people talk about you, your neighbors, your coworkers, I think they should say something along the lines of, I don't know what's going on with that person, but he seems to have this extreme followership of this God that they believe in because they always do things that don't make sense. God will always call you to do things that often go against the flow. And it takes extreme followership. It takes faith. Not one-time faith, daily faith. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, I 
one, thank you for my son. When my wife and I have tried to raise and point in the right direction, and then when he can teach me a deep biblical truth like that, wow. What a great reminder that we're all going through something all the time. Would you help all of us to just say, hey, we don't know if we're gonna get into the program or not. We don't know if we're gonna get the job. We don't know if we can uh, uh, handle the diagnosis. We don't know this, this, or this, but we know what you're calling us to do today, and that's just to trust you. That's just to follow your leading. And so God, would you help us to take our hands off the wheel and we trust you to drive. You've never let us down. Every time you've, you've driven, you've never let us down. You're not my middle school buddy. You're the God of the universe who sent your one and only son to die for my sins. I think you can be trusted. And so God, I pray for all of us in this room. Would you help us to lean in? Would you help us to have an extreme followership of the Father as Jesus taught us? Would you help us to be discipled? Help us to have somebody that's pouring into us. That's why we have uh, things like Rooted and all of our other groups. And I pray for the man or woman that's here today and they've heard messages like this today, but they've never fully surrendered. And I believe today somebody needs to give up the wheel for the very first time and throw their hands up and surrender and give their life to you. And so I pray, God, would they do that in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.